Hello? Oh, okay. You'll, you'll stop me if I'm taking too long. Well, hello. I'm, my name's Clay Mackle. Some people, if you're talking to some of us, you always hear us talk about back in the wedge or when we're in the wedge. And when we're referring to that, that's our building in Santa Clara, California. And it's shaped, it has that big angular shape, and that's what we mean when we talk about that. But we'll go on to uh, what my talk is. I'm the, I actually been recently, my title changed. I'm now Chief Software Architect. I guess he wanted to give me a new name. I think I was Senior Software Architect. Maybe that makes me feel younger. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I report directly to the Vice President of Engineering. And I actually I joined Apple in 1986. Uh, when Claris was formed, I uh, moved over to there. I was the 16th employee. And uh, Frank Liu, our president, actually was working on FileMaker before me at, uh, at Claris. I was working on other products that never ended up shipping because Apple canceled them for us. Um, and then, but eventually I started working on the, the Windows port um, of FileMaker. I wrote the first version of FileMaker Server. I was one of the key developers on instant web publishing in the 4.0 timeframe for the 1.0 web world. I haven't really dealt much with the, the WebDirect, which is a web 2.0 solution. Uh, CDML, which was officially called the Claris Dynamic Markup Language, but some people call it the Clay Dynamic Markup Language. Um, was one of the, we had a team of basically three engineers and was the, the core designer of the Draco engine with uh, John Thatcher, who was here, I believe, last year. He was the manager of the team at that time. He's now back as a developer again. And I worked with Christopher Krim to come out with the first version of Go. I'm, even though the session says we'll be talking about what happened in Vegas, I, I'm going to kind of switch around my, uh, my sessions and start off with the history first. Because as I go through talking about what happened in Vegas, I'll be using a lot of terms that I'll be defining uh, in this part of the session. And I, I may get into some of the Vegas stuff at that point. But I'll talk about some of the history. Um, you got a quick view of the eras of the main FileMaker product, but I'm going to be mainly talking about the engine itself and the different eras of the engine, not the, the, the products that actually use the engine. The major components of the Draco engine, how data moves around in it, some of the scripting and user model stuff, and what happens when a, a FileMaker file is open. Um, I'll talk more about that when I get there. Now, you've seen the slide already. It's all our products. They're all using the Draco engine. I'm going to, this is the component I'm going to be mainly talking about. Um, and, and how all those other products around there uh, talk to the center portion. As we mentioned before, it's the 30th anniversary. A lot of the design decisions that were made in the Draco engine, actually it wasn't called the Draco engine 30 years ago. It was, uh, the term was kind of called the HBAM engine. And I'll get into more details what HBAM stands for. Uh, it originally was uh, a DOS product. It was the first version of the engine in a product called Nutshell. And then when the Mac 128K came out, the developer said, oh, this is a great new platform. Let's, you know, we want to be the first database on this platform. So they ported it over. And that version of the engine actually could just you know, easily run on a 128K, 68,000-based machine off 400K floppies. Um, and some of the design decisions that were done there to run in that type of memory footprint, we're, we're still taking advantage of now. And this is one of the reasons why we could run on iOS easily. Our engine does not require large amounts of memory. It, it, it is designed for a, a smaller style computers. There's, there's four main eras for the FileMaker engine. Um, there's before Claris slash FileMaker bought the product. There's the flat file era. There's the early relational era and the, the, the Draco based version. The early era before FileMaker, so these are the early about boxes. Um, it was one table per file. Uh, there was no scripting, actually, in the first one. Um, but some of the key aspects of how FileMaker work were uh, defined back then. Uh, things like variable-sized fields. Um, they didn't understand you know, why uh, certain SQL databases and other databases back at that time period, you had to define that you know, a field could only have 20 characters. Um, 
everything was variable sized. Uh, the whole concept of doing um, query by form that you could type in uh, uh, the things you want to search based in a form version as opposed to coming up with a language defining saying and or with parentheses and all that stuff. So a lot of those key decisions were made back then and are, are decisions that kind of drive the, the, the design coming forward. Later when, uh, well, I see. The versioning was actually kind of weird back then. We started with 1.0, then went to plus, then went to 4. And then when FileMaker, and when Claris bought it, then it became FileMaker II, then it became Pro, and then it became FileMaker Pro 2. But at least the numbering has been a lot more consistent since that point. Uh, at this point, when Claris purchased the product, we started adding in, that's where ScriptMaker came in, the initial designs of that, the whole scripting system. Um, the whole, at that point, the, the Mac draw style environment of creating layouts was formed. Looked at how Mac draw was working back then and FileMaker, you'd see the same type tools, the same type of uh, techniques for how objects were laid out, the layering of that. Uh, there was no real good containment. It was all the same limitations that Mac draw had too. This is an early timeline of what was happening back in those first 10 years. Uh, so back in 88, I started working on the, the Windows version. It got canceled when the new president came into Apple. Then I started working on the Windows version again. It got canceled again when the next president of Apple changed. And then the third time was the charm, working on the FileMaker 2 version of Windows. It finally shipped. Around this time period, Access was coming out. And we knew that a flat file database wasn't going to basically cut it at that point. We were scared that Access was going to actually ship on the Macintosh too, which that never actually happened. But we were very, we were convinced that Microsoft was going to do that because they were doing it with all the other products. Um, and to answer that threat, we basically uh, took a two-prong approach. Um, we had an idea of how to make the base FileMaker engine relational by doing a file-to-file -file relationship. You'd have a relationship between one file and another file if you were still stuck with one table per file at that point. Um, and the second approach was to start writing a new database engine, which was called Spectre at this point, back in 92. The Spectre engine was going along 3.0, which had the file-to-file the -file relationship, which was supposed to be the short-term fix, was uh, completing up. And then the team was trying to start moving the application onto the new Spectre engine. The new Spectre engine was more your typical SQL engine with the fixed fields um, the lockdown schema. It didn't have any notification mechanism. Um, it had a lot of the non, it was kind of like the standard SQL engines at that point. And the amount of code that was having to be written to, to map the FileMaker world on top of that was getting larger and larger. And at that point, the people that were doing that were saying, well, why are we using the Spectre engine? We might as well just write our own um, based off some of the uh, algorithms and techniques from the uh, engine that we got from Neshoba. So basically, the Spectre engine was uh, terminated back in 97, and that's when the Draco engine started. That team was pretty much, that team wasn't very happy that they, we, we didn't like their engine and we couldn't use it, and most of those employees ended up leaving at that point. So while the Draco engine was starting, we still had versions being released on the, the file-to-file -file relationship uh, model, the older model. It was a relational database, but it was a bit harder to, to manage. Though a lot more features did come out at that time. You know, the 4.0 time frame, ODBC was starting to be developed. That's when the, uh, the Web 1.0 point, the Web 1.0 technologies was coming out. CDML came out. Um, XML, XSLT, web stuff come out, came out. All the way going up through the, the, the FileMaker Pro 5.0 time frame. So this is actually a picture of the Draco team. Uh, we had big Halloween parties back in Claris at the time. And this is, I don't know how many of you know Gilligan's Island, but we had a Gilligan's Island theme. Um, though Keith and I, neither of us wanted to be Marianne, so we decided to have two skippers instead. So in 2004 is when 7.0 finally came out. And this was the, the first release of the Draco engine was in the 7.0 time frame. It was a pretty massive change. Um, the, the previous engine in FileMaker uh, from the, the Neshoba time frame 
didn't use uh, Unicode. It was using single bytes for each one and it had a single byte sequence. So like the Japanese version Pro 4 was using Shift Gist as the encoding for characters inside uh, FileMaker. Um, other versions in other languages, like we were, um, the Eastern European ones were using Latin 2 instead of Latin 1. Um, so it was a mess to interoperate international versions uh, prior to us moving to Unicode. With the move to Unicode, at least we have the same character set for all characters. You still run into imaging problems doing left to right for Arabic, doing the, the kanjis and stuff like that on, in uh, the Asian countries. But it does simplify at least how you store stuff on disk. Is, there's a, a unified way to store that. Pro 7, because of the, that Unicode changing, um, the, the join graph came into existence. You could put multiple tables in one file. The join graph did a, was a really a, a drastic different change with how you're doing relationships between file to file. You could have paths of files. You know, the concept that you had to have uh, multiple TOs, table occurrences. You, you couldn't make loops in the graphs. And that was a, a major uh, file format change which caused a lot of pain. So we're going to hopefully never go through that again. Hopefully the, the 11 to 12 was not as painful. Though it had its pain points too. But it, it wasn't nearly as bad as the 7.0 file format change. Uh, 11 came out. Um, and then 12, yeah, 12 was the next big file format change. That's when we actually changed the, the model for uh, uh, the layouts. Layouts went from the, we stuck with that Mac draw model for a very long time, all the way up through uh, 11. And 12 is when we went through and we knew we were going to go, need to go to the web tour world, um, needed to move to something like cascading style sheets. People had been wanting to share styles between multiple objects. Uh, and we really had to redo the entire drawing engine at that point and base things on cascading style sheets. So I'll go through the, the major different components of Draco. So the Draco engine is just not your, your typical uh, database engine. It does have tables. It does do queries. Uh, it manages the locking of records, uh, protecting so that there aren't conflicts between multiple users. But it also includes the scripting subsystem, uh, live notifications. This is something that many other databases don't do. I think there's a way to set it up in Oracle to do it, but no one ever uses it. Um, and, and the user state model. The, the user state model, the, the engine is keeping track of what the user has, what the, the main window is for that file. Um, it, it's mainly done because of how the scripting system works. It's very context sensitive. Your, your scripts work on whatever the active field is, whatever the active window is, the, the active layout. The engine is split up into multiple layers. Uh, you can actually see this if you go to the hard drive and you look for the DLLs. If, if you go through and you're interested and you look at the DLLs or the frameworks on the Mac OS. The, the lowest level, we call the support layer. That's the uh, OS abstracts, uh, uh, um, the OS layer. Uh, so there's a version for Mac, there's a version for Windows, uh, there's a version for iOS, and um, as you heard earlier, there's a, now a version for Linux too. And this is how uh, we can keep all the common code above there easily and move it to other platforms. And not only is it just for different platforms, um, the, if we just look at the Mac version, the initial version of Draco was written when uh, Classic, that was before Mac OS X, when the first Draco engine came out. So we had our own threading model, we had our own file I.O. system, and all the APIs were defined in there, but it used drastically different calls than were used when OS X came out. When OS X came out, we moved to the Carbon APIs. The Cocoa APIs were still way too primitive at that point on the first release of Mac OS X to uh, actually make it useful. But in the meantime now, uh, Carbon is being deprecated over time. And uh, now the OS, the, the support layer is now, uh, either they're using the core foundation APIs or the, the Cocoa APIs, depending on which uh, services we're using. So that layer is actually pretty much changing all the time. And as uh, Apple goes through and changes the OSs. Even um, like file I.O., they keep changing how uh, some low-level networking calls are working. We have to keep tweaking things underneath there to make it work as the OS keeps changing. The next layer above it, this, 
box, the the algorithms that are used by it, and the techniques, and the, the actual you know theory of operation has goes all the way back to the nutshell time frame. Um, it's it's what we call HBAM, uh, hierarchical B tree access method is I think what uh, the Neshoba guys uh, named it after. We just call it HBAM. It handles the the logical to physical representation. If you look at our file format document, it's a list of nodes and subnodes, uh, just like a tree with leaves that have, have the actual data. HBAM is the, the, the mechanism that maps that tree and then turns it into blocks that are stored on the actual disk. And I'll, I'll go in a little bit more detail how that works. The next layer above that is the DB engine layer. It's another DLL. Uh, I think most recently, I think we've mer merged HBAM into the DB engine just to cut down the number of DLLs that we're having we're finding some of, in some ways, it's getting uh, uh, faster to load it. The, the fewer the frameworks and DLLs you have, um, there's less work the OS has to do to manage stuff. So we're, we're trying to merge some of these things together. But this is where the calculation engine is. Networking is done. Um, the queries, locking. This is where you think uh, most standard uh, database operations are occurring down in this layer. The next layer above that, we call it FM engine. This is where layouts are stored, but not rendered. This is the, the layout store. It knows how to cascade style sheets, but it'll just give you a binary representation of what the objects are after you do the, the cascade operation. Um, it knows about scripts. It doesn't know how to edit scripts, but it knows how to store them, how to run them. Uh, the user model is there. It's the thing that uh, keeps track of the number of virtual, or the number of windows that are located. So even when you're executing a script on uh, server-side scripting, there are windows. Uh, the, the, the user model is keeping track of these uh, 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 window objects. Now, these, this all, all this code is in C++. So when uh, the application like FileMaker Pro uh, builds with the Draco engine, they derive classes based off the window class from the engine. And when that uh, class is constructed, it constructs a real uh, Mac window or a real Windows window. Um, it may even create a window. On iOS, there really is only one window per app if you look at how the code actually works. What you're seeing inside the, the view or what's being drawn are, are separate views. So while the Draco engine is keeping track of multiple, quote, windows inside iOS, even though there's only one real window, what the code there, that derived code in, in the Go code is doing is keeping track of uh, which view these things are associated with and whether we even have a view stored with it. What's being worked currently is a new layer that's being uh, moved down into the Draco engine. Uh, we were talking about how we're moving PDF support so that uh, WebDirect can have access to it, so that server-side uh, scripting can have access to it. Um, so we're moving what we call the design surface. Uh, in 12, when we move to the new CSS-style layouts, um, Go had its own draw engine. Uh, that was written for the 11 version, and it was running out on a separate track than how basically Go and the new design surface was being developed at the same time. And there was no way to, uh, it was too complex to have the two teams integrate and do things the same way, because we wanted to release Go first, and then the design surface work for the uh, uh, cascading style sheet stuff came out later. Um, but at this point now, we're, we're trying to merge uh, these logic, this logic together. Uh, and put it in one place and move it down into the Draco engine. Because once something is down in the Draco engine, then it's easily shareable between all the, the, the big family of products. When you, you saw that big graph where Draco is at the middle, we can use it in the Mac, Windows, iOS, WebDirect, server-side scripting, um, ODBC. Uh, it opens up its ability to be able to use by all our products. Next, I'm going to move on to how FileMaker moves data around and how data uh, flows through the engine. Um, mentioned that there, there's HBAM. So HBAM manages this logical data structure and pushing it into these blocks. Our blocks currently are uh, 4K in size. The original engine from Neshoba had 512K blocks. In the 3.0 time frame, we bumped it to 1. And then uh, in 7, we bumped it up to 4. Um, a question we had uh, 
I think two days ago, they say, well, why did we pick four, or why didn't we use four earlier? Um, at the point that we were doing these major file format changes, we go through and we try the different block size to see how the file systems react to it. Um, and at the point that, you know, in 98, the 4K block size actually worked better than having 2K blocks or 8K blocks at that point, because most disk, disk subsystems back then were moving things back and forth in 4K chunks anyway. Um, today now with SS um, D drives, or the solid state drives, block sizes aren't nearly as important. We could probably even move up the block sizes larger, um, but that would really require a file format change, and we remember the paint from 7, so um, the 4K block size seems to still be working pretty well with SSD drives, but if we ever come through and decide that there's some reason that we need to have a major file format size, we may, uh, major file format change, we may come back and uh, uh, look at that size again. Now we have all these blocks that make up the file. There's two style blocks, one that, that actually contains the data. Um, these are like where the record data is stored, where layouts are stored, where scripts are stored, where yield schema is stored, all that stuff. There's another series of blocks called index blocks. Now these aren't, you know, field indexes. These don't don't say that oh this word is in this field. These index blocks just mark what part of the logical tree and what uh, where the container, um, where the content block that contains that portion of the tree is located. And this can actually be multiple layers. There's always one root block. That Means that may contain pointers to other index blocks, that then those index blocks point to other index blocks. Um, when you start getting into the tens of terabyte size of file makers, you can start getting up to 12 levels of blocks at that point. We do have one customer that has uh, pushed all the data from every trade in the year uh, 2013, I think, of the uh, uh, Chicago commodities market into FileMaker. And it's a 2.2 size, 2.2 terabyte size file. Um, he's currently has one field indexed, and he's going through and indexing more. Uh, his customer wants to do some business intelligence style logic on it, and the customer doesn't mind waiting. You know, they're doing more historical searches and stuff like that, so they don't care if it takes like two weeks to index one field. Um, it's working, but you have to be patient. Um, we all thought he was a little crazy, but. The, the developer's happy and the customer's happy. He's running into some issues with how uh, he, there's so many records that it doesn't fit in some of the dialog boxes and you know there's display issues occurring and you basically can't use the scroll bar at all. Um, but as long as you're just doing queries, you know they always do view by form all the time. They don't try to do view as list. And as long as you, he knows some things just to stay away with, and he, he's doing queries, and he says on that one index field, you know, he's he's getting almost instantaneous response coming back for his searches and stuff like that. So, as long as he's happy, um, I probably don't recommend going up to that size files, but someone is doing it. These different size blocks, um, we do have a RAM cache inside the the process space where we store it on the Pro product. You can set that option in the file options. Um, application settings on the pro uh, products and server I think it's called uh, the database cache which is in the, uh, the administration uh, API where you can set that these uh, caches were pretty important when you had the slower hard drives when you had uh, drives that were only spinning at you know maybe 3,000 rpms or something like that now that SSD drives are coming out the the, the need for us to cache the blocks in memory, so that we don't have to read them from the drive over and over again isn't nearly as important. Unless you're, um, if, if you're still really pushing for speed and you're using the encryption at rest, that is a point where the cache is still important at that point. Uh, you may, may want to keep the cache up because we decrypt as we load it into the cache or when we, or, and we uh, encrypt as we push stuff from the cache out to the disk again. So if you have a, a encrypted database that needs to be fast, you'll probably want to make sure your cache size is large enough to hold it all in memory. If you're not using encryption at rest, using SSD drives instead, you can probably cut this cache size down because SSD drives are you know, not as fast as accessing memory directly, but nearly as fast. And as I mentioned, I think I actually talked much of this already. 
we have a hierarchical format. Uh, call it HMAM. There's branches and leaves. And most Draco operations, um, like creating records, is you know, when you create a record, you create a branch. And then you create a sub-branch for each field underneath it that has data. And you then create leaves underneath each of those fields to store the, the actual text in each field. Now, it is a sparse tree. I mean, we don't create a branch for every field unless there's actually data stored in that field. Um, even though we don't present it to the user, we do actually have the we do have the concept of null and empty as two different database operations. For some people with SQL database knowledge, knows that there is a difference between empty and null, and the, the low-level Draco engine does do that. But we've never presented an interface to the user to tell the difference between that. You can't do a search for null and a search for empty. Um, unless you're a professional database developer, most people wouldn't know what the difference between that is. But uh, the actual engine underneath actually knows that. So we have temporary files. Um, so when the main file is open, whether locally or over the network, even in locally, you have file A. Uh, which is full of blocks, and then we open up a, a, a temporary file uh, that matches that file. If you open up the file over the network, the client will actually have a temporary file too that represents that file up there. And we do have a file per session per uh, file. So in, in WebDirect, if you have five users using WebDirect at the same time, each opening five files, that means there's 25 temporary files open. You don't share temporary files between different users. This is how we can keep track of while users are making certain changes and how we can handle the, the delay and how notifications get pushed out and how users are seeing slightly different versions of the database at the same time. Their concept of the real world is the data that's in their temp file. And if the data is not in their temp file, then they request data from the, the server or from the main file to be moved there. In the local case, um, quite often we won't move the data from file A to, to the temp file. Um, um, because we can access it. We, we have the main file locally, and we can access it there directly. But when you start changing data and you start making uh, changes, we make the changes in the temp file, and then the commit operation is the thing that moves stuff back to the real file. External container data has changed this a little bit in that now the containers are stored in another folder that you can specify whether you're using encrypted, uh, no, secure storage, I think, is the terminology used in the, the product. The problem I have is I know all the names in the source code, and they don't match all the names that are used in the product. So you call what, what you guys call table occurrences, we call table aliases internally. So we have, we have TAs, but everyone else calls them TOs. But, um, so th this container data is actually stored over there. There's not a temp version on the host side. But as you access uh, external container data, we'll download them into a cached folder that's on, that the clients have. The temporary files have always been encrypted uh, since 7. I guess before 7, they weren't encrypted. But 7, uh, we always encrypted them. Though before the encryption at rest came out, it was only a 32-bit key. Uh, now, if uh, the file, and we still use that 32-bit key if you're opening unencrypted files. Um, it was mainly so that you couldn't see it if you were opening hosted data. You couldn't see the copy that was stored locally. But if you use encryption at rest and turn it on, uh, we change the encryption of the temporary files to also match that of the main file. It'll be the full AES 256-bit key encryption. The temp file, over time, will end up usually looking almost like a copy of the main file, especially in the client host situation. As you ask for data, we check to see if we already have it in the temp file. The, the logical tree that I'm talking about, uh, the representation of the tree is basically the same in both the temp file and the main file. It's just that the temp file usually just has a subset of it. So as the clients ask for data, it ends up bringing portions of those trees down into the local uh, temp file, and then we'll access it there. But when display starts getting low, uh, in a case on both uh, the uh, clients and iOS. And the disk size starts getting less than 250 megabytes of free disk space available. We'll start uh, purging stuff from the temp file to make sure that there's enough free disk space. We only purge stuff that isn't being used. Some stuff is purged in, in the order of uh, 
um, you know, what was the least, what was the thing that was used the uh, longest ago? Um, sometimes it's just kind of random. We we just delete everything. It depends on whether it's records, layouts, scripts. Um, uh, we never delete schema, but uh, we start doing purging then. And then for the the. Can you hear me? Ah, OK. Uh, is, is stored in the same folder where like uh, your browser stores uh, GIFs and JPEGs and stuff like that for web browsers. Uh, that you'll, if you dig around in there, you'll see that there's a FileMaker folder, and there'll be a whole bunch of uh, uh, container objects that will be stored in there uh, that represent those things. I'm going to pop me forward to the next one. Or, And OK, I was talking about that. The, if there's more than two gigabytes available on the hard drive, we'll still keep storing containers over and over again. And we'll, uh, but we'll never, we'll, we'll start purging those. And those we're a little bit more careful on deleting ones. We make sure we keep them around at least, I think, 10 minutes before we start purging them uh, in case you go back to that record that needed that container field. On iOS, uh, it has a tighter limit. The, the limit is uh, one gigabytes instead. So. In this tree structure I'm talking about, there's one branch for each table. Inside that branch for a specific table, there's two main branches. There's one branch for embedded containers, or actually all containers, and another branch that contains the record data. There's some other smaller branches in there, too, that contain things like a field schema. Um, in the main file, there's actually a branch that ends up being quite large. It's the indexes. These are the, the word indexes to actually do queries and uh, joins. Um, but the indexes are never downloaded to clients. The, the indexes are always managed and only used by the host. In the record branch, and there's more branches for each record. There's branches for fields, as I mentioned before. Container data, uh, when there's a field that's marked as a container, uh, it's the, the special field type. For other fields, whether it's numbers, dates, times, uh, timestamps, we store everything as text. We never store binary representations of uh, numbers or dates. We always store everything as text. And this is one of the reasons why it's pretty easy to go through and say, well, I want this to be a number field. No, I want it to be a text field. You know, Are zip codes text fields or number fields? What should they be? Uh, you can make these transitions pretty easily because we're just changing the schema and basically, the only thing that happens when you change a field type is basically how we index it and do queries on it. The actual data store is not changed. Container fields are the special case. Container fields actually just store a key or a, uh, a path in the tree structure that points to where in the container branch that that container is actually located. And in, in containers, so we have this big branch, and they're just randomly numbered container keys basically stored in there. Uh, a container, if it's in an external stored, externally stored or uh, securely stored, it actually just has a pointer that has the complete path of where the actual container is actually stored on the hard drive. If it's a securely stored container field, it also includes the password used to decrypt that data. Each container that's stored in external storage is encrypted uh, with a different password, basically. 
And the thing that's managing all those passwords is this uh, container branch. If it's embedded, then the actual data for the container is stored inside the, the actual file, inside the HBAM blocks. We do go through and we, um, in addition to having paths and stuff like that, there's a MD5 hash of the container data. So when you insert a new container data, the first thing we do is we go through and we do a hash of what you're trying to insert. And then there's a little index inside the container stuff that says uh, what hashes have already been stored. If we see that that container has, has already been stored once before, um, we see that the hash matches and we just bump the reference count up by one. So if you go through, this, this was a lot more important back in the earlier time frames when you had these stored container fields where like someone would use a green light meaning that you know the invoice was good or a red light meaning that was bad. You know, people, before we did this uh, reference counting on container objects, you'd have you know a couple thousand green images stored and you know a couple hundred red images stored. Now uh, with this container ref counting, uh, you only have one green image and one red image stored. Um, So in the networking case, um, as an optim, um, I guess not as an optimization, but how FileMaker has always worked is that uh, when you access a record on the client, um, we only we manage things at the record level instead of the field level. So the minute you access one field in a record. Um, and it's not in the temporary file in the host guest situation, we'll download that entire record into the, the client's temp file. Um, this makes managing this stuff easier because um, with something else that other databases don't tend to have are stored calculations. Uh, this is something that's kind of a, a unique thing to the, the FileMaker Draco engine of where you push fields in and then we actually do the calculation and then we actually store it there. All stored calculations run always at full access, basically. Uh, your access level that when you're inserting data does not uh, modify that stuff. So coming through and trying to do field by field to just limit in the specific fields downloading, the, the dependency graph that would have to be generated would start getting pretty complex if we had to figure out, well, I want to see this field, but it's a stored field. If someone changes something, we may need to lead, download this field and this field and this field too, but only if they have permissions to see that field. Um, so basically, as a, a simplification, to make sure that we get the code right, that's one of the reasons why we always download an entire record. We do download multiple records at one time. Uh, this changes over time a little bit. Um, sometimes, uh, how many records will prefetch? I think the current code actually will download one record first to get it on to display it immediately, and then a background thread will start downloading other chunks. Um, and this logic keeps tweaking as we keep finding different ways to do it and, and better ways to do it. Uh, we are moving to, uh, the clients are starting to move to doing more things on multiple threads. Um, I know people are a little bit tired of saying, oh, file, you know, I have 16, you know, processors on my machine. Why is it when I'm running the FileMaker client, I see one processor is being used at 100% and nothing else is being used. We are in the process of changing that. and. Um, I mean, get into a big, a big uh, issue that may be causing some of you problems as we make things more multi-threaded in, in a couple slides. Uh, containers, uh, as I mentioned, the, the record data for container fields only stores a key pointing to where the actual container is located. That key comes down when the record is downloaded, but the actual container data doesn't come down until it's actually referenced. The other thing is that actually even with containers, when you have the key, when the imaging code, the design service code, the, the, the new module that's being moved down into Draco, um, when it wants to image, a, uh, or when it wants to display an image, it always asks the engine saying, oh, I want to display this image, and this is the size I want to display it in. And uh, sometimes it passes the resolution down if you're printing. And I think in the future, I think this is a feature you'll be getting is that you, uh, when you generate PDFs, you're going to be able to eventually specify the, the DPI that you want your images at. Because I know on PDF, sometimes it's different whether you're generating PDFs for usage on the web versus PDFs for usage for printing purposes. And you know, if you're printing it, you probably do want 600 DPI images 
embedded in your PDFs. But if you're, all you're doing is pushing PDFs to be viewed, then you, you know, maybe 72 DPI or 100 DPI is fine. And it doesn't make a big difference in the size of the PDFs. But all this logic is uh, controlled by the, the, this thumbnailing code that we have. So when the uh, OS, or when the client asks for it, and wants to draw this image, he gives the size and the DPI. And the host will go through and then actually generate the thumbnail for it. It, it actually may not technically be a thumbnail in, in what your users would think of a thumbnail, but we call it all thumbnails. Any image that is rendered from the original data source, we call the thumbnail. These things are created there on the client side now, and I think that went in 13 and in 14. Uh, we do the thumbnailing on uh, separate threads back inside the client too. So now when you bring up a, a layout, you'll notice that sometimes the containers don't draw immediately. That's because there's another thread running around in the background generating the thumbnails. And when the thumbnail is complete, it uses the FileMaker standard notification mechanism saying, oh, I have data. It, it actually is coming through as like a data change notification that's coming through saying that, oh, the data of this container field has changed, even though it really hasn't changed. All, it, all that's happened is that the imaging of the thumbnail has been completed. So now the client can actually draw it. So far, I've been talking a whole bunch about how the client temp file is used. But there is also a temp file on the host. So what is that thing is used for? What is the, why do we have that file there? The main purpose for that file is for when you change data inside FileMaker, whether you're changing layouts, changing schema, changing scripts, changing records, changing uh, container fields. What we do in that case is that all the editing is being done on the client inside this temp file. So as you're editing a record and you edit you know, four fields or something like that, the changes are all being done in that main temp file there. When you go through and you actually do the commit operation by clicking out of the field, running the script step to do the commit, whichever mechanism you use to uh, commit the data, at that point, the, the copy of the Draco engine and the client will go through and figure out all the hosts that it needs to talk to and all the main files where they're all located. So you may have a database your database solution may have databases on different servers. It may be using, may be using a local database and a remote database. Um, we go through and we upload the files. We upload the changes, the, that, that portion of the tree, to the temp file on the different hosts. Um, not in the local case, but at least on the different hosts. Once all that data has been confirmed, that it's been uploaded to all the hosts, then we go through and send the commit operation to all those hosts saying, you know, you have this data at this location. Now move it to the main file, index it, do whatever other work you need to do to uh, make sure the file is in the main file. And then uh, when we added uh, the, the new progressive backups, it goes through and says that there's been a commit point done. Go through and make the, you need, you need to make sure you make these blocks flushed out to go into the progressive backup so that you have consistent blocks. And then that can trigger the changes if you're doing uh, standby servers to make sure that those blocks are then moved over to the other server, or the standby server. Some other networking information. Um, we tend to open one pipe between clients and the host. Um, Corba can support multiple pipes and stuff like that. It's usually they like being on this. It likes being on the same network. But when you start dealing with network address uh, or NATs in uh, in the real world, it's sometimes tough just getting that one pipe open. And our fallback is always to move data back and forth inside that one pipe all the time. Once we make one connection to the host, we know we have that connection open. We can send data in either direction, and we can guarantee get stuff back and forth. If we can open up HTTP requests to the server, because um, sometimes uh, network administrators will shut down ports for some reason, or for some reason we can't uh, go through the same path that the main pipe opened up. There's, there's so many different network topo topologies out there that can be done by people doing filtering and stuff like that. You're never guaranteed that you can get multiple streams open. But if we can, we do tend to move container fields and container objects, and not the fields, the container objects themselves, up and down using HTTP if the database is, uh, if the server is set to uh, not use SSL. If the server is set to SSL, we'll use HTTPS. That's why there's two different port numbers up there. And the other major port number that FileMaker uses, which is optional, um, 
is a zero comp, or it's called Bonjour on Apple. This is for using the browsing to find the hosts that are out there. Um, and then once we find the hosts out there, then we can ask each of the hosts what files they have open. On Windows, this is a, when you run the FileMaker installer, you'll be asked whether you want to install, uh, uh, asked if you want to install this. On Apple product, I don't, I'm not sure if there's an easy way to turn it off if you want it turned off. A lot of the Apple technologies require Bonjour working. Like I know this, uh, I have a lot of problems when going around uh, just doing uh, keynotes uh, supplies for this phone to talk to that. Bonjour needs to be working properly. And I find that most hotels tend to block Bonjour uh, packets, so you can't use it. So that's why I, I, I bring my own little network along with me all the time, so I can make sure it can work. Another part I talk about is uh, the scripting and the and the user user model. So now we go back in a little bit of history again. I just like showing old dialogues because it's you know remember the good old days. Um, you know, in the first version. You know, you, you, in the first version, you, I think you could only do one script. And, you, and these were the steps that you could turn on and off. You couldn't change the order or anything like that. Then it was improved a little bit later. You could have multiple ones. Um, didn't get much more. You got some more options with uh, uh, print and some of yours like that. In the, the 3.0 3 time frame, um, that's when ScriptMaker came into existence. This is still pre-Draco. But the, the, the script maker scheme came in, a way of doing things. And as you see, it really didn't change really much between the three. I guess I'm moving around too much. I should just stay over here. Between the 3.0 time frame and the 13 time frame. You did get a few more options. You did get a run script as full access. Um, you got duplicate, you eventually got copy and paste and stuff like that if you had the advanced version. Um, so even though it was developed in three, it was almost, well, it had to be rewritten when it was pushed into the Draco engine. But we pretty much kept everything how it worked and pretty much how everything was stored the same between those two forms. And it was stayed the same all the way through, through 13 until 14. And you got the scripting workspace, which I still call script maker sometimes, just I'm stuck with old names. The scripting workspace um, is not a, bringing in the scripting workspace did not change the Draco engine at all. Actually, during the development of the scripting workspace, um, the debug internal builds of FileMaker had both the ScriptMaker dialog and the scripting workspace dialog. So you could edit scripts two different ways at the same time. And that was used by our QA department to make sure that when you change something inside the scripting workspace, that the same options were set when you went back to the old dialog box. So even though this came out, uh, this didn't actually change the, the, the engine itself. Some people keep saying that, oh, you changed the whole engine how scripts ran. But really all we did was change how you actually edit the scripts. Now what the engine does do, how FileMaker scripting works, I mean, it's, it's not your typical scripting language. It's not like Perl or PHP and something like that. Uh, it's very context sensitive. I mean, it, it's based on a lot of it is based on what file the script is being executed from. Things like which join graphics can you use to evaluate the calculations. What the topmost window of that file that the script is located in. It may not be the, actually the topmost file that you see in the UI. It may, the, the, the context is really pointing to the topmost file of the, that is belonged, the, the topmost window of the file that the script belongs to. Things like current layout, current record, active field is very important because there's a bunch of script steps that just target, you know, insert, basically the whole insert uh, series of uh, script steps, insert into whatever the current field is. And sometimes you have the option to specify to change whatever the current field is. Scripting executes during idle time. Um, idle time is basically when the OS is not sending us events. Uh, or the user is not sending us events by keystrokes, mouse clicks, and stuff like that. Uh, we do, when, when we're at this point that we don't have any event to process that came from the user or the operating system, we will go through, and we don't just execute one script step. We'll run for a certain number of milliseconds. The amount of time that we'll 
keep executing script steps over and over is dependent on whether you're in the foreground, background, uh, how many other pending events are going on, how many scripts. Uh, I can't really just give you a you know one number. But we try to go through um, to, to make sure that it's still responsive so that the next time you click on a field or something like that, or hit the escape key, that we can go through and accept more events coming from the operating system. Uh, when it finishes running that that set, we go through, ask the OS, you know, do you have any more events for us? And then we'll go back into idle, quote, idle time, which is when we start running some more script steps. There's two flavors of script uh, triggers, and script triggers that start these script steps. The post ones are the simplest ones. The, the post script steps um, basically says, oh, I want to run this, you know, this event happened, cue the script to be run at the next available idle time. The pre, uh, pre-script triggers, these are the ones that where an event occurred, uh, like one example is the keystroke, on keystroke one. You get the keystroke, we accept the event, and we basically keep a structure of that event, a memory object of it. We don't actually process it. We run the script, that, that object is held on it, and then whether the script returns, uh, whether to accept the event or to uh, abort the event, then we'll either process the event at that point or, uh, uh, or just throw away the event. And lastly, on this part, about the FileMaker calculations. It's pretty much similar to most calculation engines, except for we don't actually use floating point operators operations. We don't use doubles or floats. Um, nowadays, it really doesn't matter because the, the floating point processors are all embedded in the chips. But in the earlier days, uh, when you had an option of to buy a floating point processor for your uh, PC, um, it never really, uh, if you were just using FileMaker on it, there was really no need to add that because we never used it. Um, so if you're buying chips or you're looking at hardware, and uh, there's no need to look at the, the floating point uh, statistics for that chip because we don't use it. Um, it's not a very important uh, stat that most people look at anymore anyway, but there's no need to worry about that. Our, if you go through and use the set uh, precision uh, function, you can move the precision up to about 400. Um, the calculation as engine is thread safe. This is where plugins can add in additional functionality. And um, as was mentioned earlier, we're going to give that same ability to uh, the scripting workspace too. Much like in the, the calculation dialog box where you see when you have in plugins installed, you'll see the plugins name and then the list of uh, plugin functions that are added. In the scripting workspace, you'll see the same thing. You'll see the plugin name and the script steps that that plugin adds. But currently, uh, in the current product, this is where you see where this is where plugins uh, appear. Calculations are a well, nearly a purely functional language. This is one of the, one of the reasons why SQL execute uh, can only do select statements. We don't. When you're a purely functional um, language. That means all operations are repeatable. If you do the same command, if you do the same calculation, you get the same exact answer each time. You can run them multiple times at the same time, you get the same answer. And uh, we try to keep it a uh, purely functional language. The, the big exception is the let statement. The let statement allows you to set three types of variables. You have uh, variables without a dollar sign in front of it which are calculation specific, those are safe. Um, those variables can't modify, you know, are completely private to the execution of that calc. But you can also set um, uh, uh, script variables which with one dollar sign or global variables with two dollar signs. And this introduced size effects. I mean, if you're using a custom function that's recursive and then calls another custom function, and if that other custom function happens to use the same local variable or global variable that the other one does, you're, you're stomping on each other in that case. So you have to be worried um, global, when you're using global variables that you're not conflicting with other things. And as I mentioned earlier, that we're doing things on multiple threads uh, when we're imaging currently. We're downloading uh, future records other, uh, that we may be displaying on another thread. We're doing the thumbnailing on other threads. Something that's coming up soon is that we're going to be using multiple threads for rendering the layout. And this may be a problem for some tricks. Like uh, One trick that I see pretty regularly 
is for people that want to measure how long it takes to draw a layout. So you have a layout object that's all the way on the back end that sets a variable, to, you know, sets a variable like start time to saying, I'm going to start drawing the layout. And then there's a, uh, another field that has an unstart calc that's at the top of the tree, or, or that's in the, the front of all other ones. Then that reads that variable, subtracts the current time, and then prints out a number saying, you know, it took, you know, 16 milliseconds to draw this layout. The problem is that that's not going to necessarily work anymore. If there's a portal on that layout, we may be rendering that portal on a different thread. So it may come through and you may get a value of saying that, oh, it only took like a half a millisecond to actually draw the layout. Um, and maybe we're following what Volkswagen is doing. We'll, we'll just lie to you how fast things are working. Um, I didn't use that one in Germany. Um, <laughs> the, so you have to be very careful about when you're using uh, variables and let statements. Um, because you really, and this includes not only unstored calcs, this includes um, tricks that I've seen people using where they're using the new uh, uh, visibility calculation, whether a layout object is visible or not. Uh, container, uh, conditional formatting. Any, anything where a calc is evaluated as part of the, the, the layout drawing portion you have to be very careful when you use globals in there because you're not going to be guaranteed what order, how often, and when those calculations may be called. We may eventually start getting to the point where we're drawing multiple records at the same time. We may be rendering, as I go and talk about iOS uh, tomorrow, um, how we're doing different records in different views. We may spawn those things off on two different threads. So if you're using one global for uh, some purpose, uh, that needs to be set in one place and use the other one, that global may be being changed all the time as two records are being drawn at the same time. So you have to be very careful there. Now if you're using let to set variable names or using the set variable script step, you're safe there. Scripts are always going to be single threaded. We aren't going to start running a sort, you know, that's three steps down from the current set variable. So scripts will always be sequential and uh, single-threaded. It's just if you're using these tricks in the layouts themselves, you have to be uh, you have to watch out for that in the future, and don't depend on that. This next part, uh, in some other presentations, I threw this inside the uh, uh, what happened in Vegas, but here uh, I, I've moved it up a little bit earlier because I have time at this point to do, I'll talk about. It. Is what happens when FileMaker file is open. There was a performance panel that we did in the, that I was a member of in Las Vegas uh, where we were going through and answering a whole bunch of questions. There was a bunch of questions that were posted beforehand, and then we were taking uh, live Twitter questions. It's actually nice taking questions when you can only type them in 140-some-odd characters. Um, I, I thought it worked out well. Uh, some people did complain, but... Um, and this one I answered off like in, you know, maybe a minute, minute, 15 seconds or something like that. And I went quickly through a whole bunch of things that happened. And people were out in the audience scribbling like mad. They were taking screenshots. Well, no, there was nothing to take a screenshot of. They, all they did was could take a picture of me because I was just describing it. Um, but then they were coming up afterwards. Yeah, can you write this up? Can you, know, summarize this? Um, so on my trip over to Europe, I went through and actually created a series of slides to answer this question, since it seemed to have a, a seemed to be a question that everyone wanted answered. Um, so there's seven major steps in the, the opening of a file. We have path list, path list processing, finding the file, creating the temp file, login, and it kind of starts like how the, the, the different layers of the Draco engine I was talking about. You can kind of think of the, the first two as like the support layer. It's just getting the OS, trying to find where the thing is, and actually open the file. Then we kind of move up into the DB engine layer where we're creating the temp file, log in, uh, do that part. And after that operation has worked, then we go up to the next layer of the database engine um, with, that's called FM engine, doing that level type processing, starting the scripts and stuff like that. And then after opening, we get into the design service portion where I actually start doing drawing. So for the path list processing, um, some people don't realize that when you're in, when you're uh, 
defining an external file that you want to be connected to when you're specifying a file, specifying a file to be to export or to import. You get this big dialog box with this big text field, and you hit the browse button and select the file, and it enters one line there. But you can actually type in multiple lines in there. Um, uh, you can say, you know, on the Mac, look at this path. On the Windows, use this path, or try this network network host first, or try the local files host first. Um, uh, was it nine where we added global variable support for? I forgot which version, but we added uh, that you could put variables inside these fields too. Uh, in some cases, I know there people want us to add it to more, but at least for import and export, you can set it there. Uh, where we'll replace global variables with the values you have to specify the paths. We turn, you can specify relative paths or full paths, and we remove paths that are not valid. Uh, so as an example here, I have, uh, I say we're working in this invoices uh, FMP12 file. I have uh, four things defined that I defined in Script Maker, uh, Scripting Workspace, sorry. The first one is a relative path. It says it doesn't care what OS it's on, but I want to open up the line items file that's uh, next to wherever the invoice file is located, whether it's on the same host, same folder, whatever. Um, the next choice, if we can't find that one, use whatever the dollar it variable, whatever that expands to. And then if you can't find those, then we have file win and file Mac. You know, look for this at this location on the Windows or this location on the Mac. So the, the step one is to do this processing. And basically what you see is the first four lines gets turned into what you see as the, the last three lines. We go through and we uh, process everything, turn them into absolute paths. We go through and we remove paths that are not applicable. Um, like if you have networking turned off, uh, we remove the networking lines from there. Uh, if it's on a Mac, we remove the, dot, the file win lines. If it's Windows, we remove the Mac lines. Um, there's probably going to be a file Linux that will be uh, showing up eventually. Uh, we, we, we didn't change it. for. We had some discussions on iOS, whether to have a file iOS, but we figured that file Mac would... Uh, the directory structures on iOS and the Mac OS are pretty similar, so we didn't come up with a separate uh, file iOS. And we're not even sure if really file Linux or Unix is really necessary, but we're, we're still trying to decide that. But the main thing is that after the pathless processing, we end up with this, this list, this process list. So step two is to actually use this list and to start looking for where the file is located. If, uh, we take the first line of that list, uh, and we check to see if we have that file already open. If it's already open, we'll try to reuse it. And this is usually mostly important when you're doing um, you know, the separation model. You have an interface file and a data file, and you may have multiple data files or multiple interface files. If you have the data file open already once, we don't want to open it up a second time if we already have it. So the first thing is to go through and check to see if we have the file already open. If it was already open, then we just use that file. And the whole process of finding the file is done at that point. The next thing is look for whether it's an FMNet, whether it's a network path or not. If it is a network path, we check to see if we already have a connection to the host. As I mentioned um, earlier in the networking portion, um, we keep one pipe open between the client and the host. And this is, if uh, you're opening multiple files, we'll still use that same connection for multiple files. The GIOP BIDER directory that Corba, Corba uses uh, can support multiple requests going back and forth over the same line. Um, if we don't have a connection to that host, that's when we'll try to open a connection to the host. And this is where really the first delay during the opening process. If people say, you know, why does it take so long to open a file? Uh, this is the first potential location where the, uh, a delay can be entered. Um, it depends on your, your, your ne networking situation. Um, I mean, if the IP address, well, we can't resolve the domain name or something like that, uh, we get an error back. The, the amount of time that we get th that error depends on how fast your DNS is. If we can resolve it and the IP address is not routable for some reason, we can get back a pretty fast uh, response from the network saying that, oh, there's no possible way to this address. You can't open this file. You'll know immediately. If the operating system thinks it's a routable, routable path to get to that IP address, that's when you'll get the delay 
of uh, at least 30 seconds as we're waiting for a response from the opposite side. Um, and it, it runs around 30 seconds. We try to set it to 30 seconds, but the OS can sometimes make it shorter or longer depending on um, uh, other things it does underneath where the, I, the ICMP packets can go through and determine that that host doesn't exist right away or whether something's caching to keep track of that. But that's all. Uh, the, the timeout is usually set to 30 seconds. If that fails, opening the connection to the host, then we go through and try the next path that's in the list of files. But if we did get the connection to the host or we know that we're opening a local file, then we try to open it for read-write access. Um, even in the hosted case, this is pretty quick. It's, a, it's just one packet going through and saying, hey, do you have a file of this name? Um, and is, can I open it for read-write access? Or you ask the local operating system, can I open this file for read-write access? If that fails, we'll go through and try again, this time asking for read-only access. Um, on the different OSs, there's different ways to make things read-write or read-only. On the Mac, there's like a couple ways to do it, whether you lock the file in the finder, or you can go through and ch change the permissions of the folder of the file. And on Windows, there's probably even more ways to do it because I never can stay awake reading all their documentation. Um, and I'm really more of a Mac guy than a Windows guy, even though I did the first Windows port. So maybe I'm a Windows 3.0 time frame. By the time NT came out, I got tired of it. Um, so if none of those find it at that time, then we go through and start at the next item in the list. Uh, the next step is to create the temp file. I mentioned how the, the temp files work. We create the temp file wherever the operating system tells us to, to save the temp file. Uh, this can sometimes be controllable uh, through some registry settings, depending on which version of the Windows operating system, you, system you're using. On the Mac OS, I think there's sometimes some low-level kernel commands that you can make to change that location. Um, you really have to study your OS and determine if you really want your temp files to be stored elsewhere than where they're being normally stored. Uh, you can use the uh, you can execute the function in FileMaker uh, get temporary path, I believe. Uh, and it will return you the path of where temporary files are being stored. I believe we'll give you a session specific one. It'll be like the path slash S1. That number is based on which session in that process. Since the pro client and go client, you only really have one user running in that thing. You always, I think, get S1. Or if there's a collision because you're using another one, you may get a, a slightly different version. But when you're running on WebDirect, or server-side scripting, you'll see that number changing quite often because you may have five users using WebDirect at the same time and they're each getting their own temporary folder. We didn't want different users conflicting that way. But the folder that's above where that S folder is located is where the main FileMaker temp files are being uh, stored at this point. We may change it in the future. Um, at this point, this is where we start downloading uh, some global information. Now, this is before we've actually logged in, but this is information that we need to know before we can log in. Uh, versioning information, what kind of versions of FileMaker can open this. This may also include specific language uh, requirements. We added in Korean indexing uh, after the 12.0 release. So if you go through and turn on Korean indexing, uh, we'll automatically bump up the, the minimal version I can open that file so that um, we don't corrupt the indexes in that case. And as a, in, as a developer, you can go through and make that change yourself, too. If there's, for some reason, you don't want 12 to open your files, you can go through and specify the minimum version number. But there's other additional version information internally used by FileMaker uh, that's downloaded in that case, so the client knows how to act with that file. Store things like window location. Um, what auto login account information to use, or whether the guest account is enabled or disabled to show you whether the button is grayed or not grayed. Um, internationalization information. At that point, um, something that is baked pretty deep into the file format is what the, the month, day, year order is, what the number separator is. I know that causes some pain in Europe, um, but that information is pretty low level baked into the file format down, and that comes down at that point. In the case of a, a reconnection, or in the case of a hibernation 
or when a Go app goes into the background. I'll go into some more detail later. We may not actually create a temp file. We may already have a temp file for the file. At that point, if we already have the temp file, uh, we synchronize the temp file at that location. We go through, we grab all the mod IDs for all the different objects that are stored in the temp file. We send it up to the server. The server checks those temp file, those mod IDs and sends back a list of things that have changed. Um, then the DB engine process, oh, the login process, sorry. If we're reconnecting, we try to reuse the same credentials that you used before, unless the FM authenticate or FM reauthenticate uh, extended privilege has timed out, then you're not allowed to do that. Next, we try the account and password from an external data source. These external data sources are things like the FMP protocol, Apple events, custom web publishings, HTTP basic authentication mechanisms, ODBC, JDBC. Basically, external sources that are coming into FileMaker where you, as part of the opening process, you specify the username and password at the same time that you, you call the open call. If that's not available, we try the parents' files credentials. If you have a script step that's doing something to open up another file or the, a join requires an external file to open, we'll try to use the parents' credentials. On Windows at this point, if you're running on Windows, we'll try seeing if we can use the uh, your single sign-on credentials. We'll go over and talk to Active Directory on the host side. Uh, if you have uh, Active Directory installed and hooked up, Next thing to try is the keychain on Mac or the credential manager on Windows. We now support that in 14. You can also have uh, uh, the same keychain support that you have on the Mac side. We now have on Windows. We also have an option to turn that off if you don't if you don't want your users to actually use the keychain. If you really want a more secure solution, uh, we hired a, we handle expired passwords. It's not really a login process, but if the password is set to expire after 30 days, at this point we handle that. And then if all those fail, then we go through and actually uh, ask the user for the account name. DB engine processing, the next box up, we download the list of tables, uh, but not their field definitions, are actually the contents of the fields. Uh, download the table occurrences, the relationships. Uh, the, the Draco engine keeps one map of all tables where they're located in all files and all the relationships between all of them. This is another point where things can slow down a bit. If you have one big join graph in a file and you open it on the host, it's not too bad. Uh, it downloads that join graph, populates the map with that. If you have two large files, or two files coming down with two large join graphs, we have to go through and integrate and uh, find out how those two join graphs overlap and keep track of all the relationships between all the files, how notifications have to get processed. So if you're in a uh, separation model, if you have one large, usually your large join graph should be in your interface file. This is where you're usually creating all the anchor buoys for all your different views and stuff you like you're going through. And as long as the, the join graph that's in the data file is nice and small, that, that just represents the true relationships between the tables, there shouldn't be too much of a performance problem. But if you repeat your join graph in your interface file, in your data file, and maybe just because to make it simpler or something like that, or you cloned the two or however you created it, the merging of those two join graphs can actually slow down the opening process quite a bit. Some opening sequences stop here because ODBC doesn't run scripts, so it's all done. FM engine processing. Uh, we start creating the virtual windows, which may create real windows on certain platforms. Uh, we start downloading the layouts, the style sheets that are associated with that layout. We download the value list definitions. So this includes custom value lists. We get the lists coming down. But if it's the value list is like saying the contents of this relationship or the contents of that field, th that data is not coming down, just the definitions of the value lists. Custom menus come down. And then script triggers start getting queued. Um, when you're opening windows, um, also, script uh, based on the, uh, the open window script triggers. And lastly, scripts that are queued from external data sources, um, like a custom web publishing or the FMP protocol, where you can specify, say, open this file and run this script. And then uh, lastly, after, after opening step, 
well, I'm just a minute over right now. Um, the operating system will most likely ask us to draw the window. At this point, we start downloading records. Um, when the next available idle event, I mentioned that before. Um, if you have a large number of records, this can be another delay point too. For the whole synchroni synchronizing mechanisms between notifications and the different Draco engines to keep everything in sync, we need to keep a list of what we think all the records are on each of the machines. And when you first connect, we download this list of records. This list of records, each record is represented by one bit. But in this case of this guy that has you know, the 26 billion records that's in this two terabyte file, that is still a lot of bits and will take a long time to download. So this is an unavoidable delay if you're opening up tables that have large number of records. If you only have 10,000 records, it's really not a problem. It's when you start getting into millions where you, you'll start seeing a bit of a delay downloading this list. And then as I talked about how data moves around in Draco, we'll be starting to download records, scripts. Um, we may start the open process again because your, your layout may uh, reference a field that contains data that's in another file. And one quick thing from the, the German side where uh, they said, yeah, well, okay, you download the scripts. For some reason, this one German was uh, storing, um, he did a lot of XSLT processing. And for documentation purposes, he was dumping the entire contents of his XST, XSLT as a comment in his script steps, which is like roughly about two or three megabytes in size. And, um, he was wondering why it was taking so long for taking so long for his scripts to download, and and he thought that uh, when you downloaded when you downloaded scripts from uh, the server that we only downloaded the actual script steps, but no, as part of a script we download all the uh, comments too in case you're going to edit it. Um, so far, I haven't found us anyone to anyone that really wants us to go through and change our code to try to strip strip out the comments in the case of you're only executing the script and then do it otherwise, but. That is something to uh, maybe worry about if you really comment your code heavily, uh, very heavily. Um, and I think that's uh, it for this time period. Uh, this afternoon I'll go into more things about uh, iOS, how it works, and uh, some more security issues. So I, can, I guess I can ask some questions now or you guys can run off to lunch, whichever you want to do. So, Yes? <laughs> Uh, and you don't you you don't use, use any auto enter serial number. Are you as as soon as you start modifying your your stuff and you're not doing okay, but just modifying stuff? Are you still locking the database for the other users in some way or doing them any harm? When you when you're editing the the, the field definitions, I talked about how there's this tree structure uh, that. In field definitions are underneath a table node and stuff like that. How all the locking works inside FileMaker is you lock portions of the tree. And when you start editing the schema of a field or of a table, we lock that table. Unfortunately, the I think what you're, you're referring to is that the, the auto enter number, the next auto enter number happens to be stored under that node. Mm -hmm. So when you actually start editing it, we've locked that node saying that no one else can modify it. So that means you won't be able to create records at that point. And we know about this issue. Um, we're trying to figure out a way to make to make this change. So, but if you're not using that, if you keep away from it, yeah. If you're not using the auto enter, uh, okay, If you're not using the, the the capabilities where you do the auto enter, uh, where the number needs to be incremented inside the field definitions. If you don't use that, then you won't run into this condition where you, users can't create records. Okay. So, if you change just uh, the, the the new modern technique is to go through and. UUID, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and going through and just creating a UUID and not using the, the automatic serial number entering is a... <laughs> right, yeah, if you go through and, and uh, for your primary keys you start using UUIDs or start generating some other number some other way and not use the auto enter. It'll, it'll actually make, if, if, even using UUIDs will make uh, merging better. Because you know, if you do a clone and re-import, you have to go through and reset that number. It's really something that we should probably mark as deprecated, that you really 
shouldn't use it unless there's some reason, but you really can't get rid of it because there's so many solutions based off of it. So that is something you should probably move away from and use some other technique to generate your primary keys. Is it possible that FileMaker server is better in dealing with small temp files than with bigger ones? I think I had a solution where there was a 10 gigabyte file and then we split it up in several small files and the server is really running smoother since that change. The internal uh, cache for blocks is usually larger on server, so it can handle, you know, it's not doing, the, the number of files doesn't hurt too much. Now one thing, this, this HBAN engine that I was talking about, that layer, it actually can run in two different modes. Um, uh, on the server side, it runs in, in a highly multi-threaded mode, um, which handles multiple guests and multiple operations. Um, in the case of, uh, on the client side, we run the HBAM engine in a different mode where basically one request basically blocks every other request going on at the same time. And this is because the, the client has been single threaded at most time. And when you're not doing as much locking, uh, things actually run faster. So the client's behavior with temp files are very different than the server's uh, interaction with temp files because of the, the, the locking mechanisms that are used underneath. So it's kind of hard to qualify, you know, which one does things faster. It all depends on the type of operations you're doing, and whether it's multiple users doing operations or a single user doing an operation. Well, it was in the multi-70 clients connected, yeah. and then we saw that there was a dramatic increase by splitting up data over several files instead of keeping it in one file. Right, yeah, that, that can help because of uh, how the multi-threading is, is done. And actually there is, uh, I mean, we do have some people working on HPAM right now, um, um, we're going through and trying to change that to actually improve that on the server side with dealing with one large file to, to start doing finer grain locking within one file um, and, and making that faster. We're having to do that style work to take, because we want to move the client to be more multi-threaded. And um, a lot of the problems of moving the client to be more multi-threaded, we're starting to run into uh, uh, contention issues with the HBAM layer. So we're going through and we're, um, I think, Frank mentions it when he talks about it that you know we have an engineer that's reworking how the locking of the at the HPAN level is being done to be more efficient. I I have a question about uh, index updates. I once learned that uh, when a client updates the index by changing a record, all other clients were temporarily paused. Is that still the case, or is that true or not true? All the temp the other clients. So are while, while an index is being updated. Mm -hmm. That's all clients, all connected clients are post. Are post? Uh, paused. 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 Oh, paused. So. Oh. Um, well, other clients, no, the, the updating of the index shouldn't block other clients from downloading data. Uh, they're not actually paused at that point. They can still download data. They can still make query. Well, if the query involves that index, um, they have to wait for that index to be finished being updated before that query can process. So yes, they can they can wait till the index is being done, but that's only but that's only if the client is actually using that index for some reason. Now, if all your users are manipulating and doing queries on the same index at the same time, yes, they will have to be paused and wait for the update operation to complete. Now, as I was talking about how things are uploaded, so you know the clients aren't paused while the data is being uploaded to the server because it's being all moved into the temp file. And the, the, the lock on the index only occurs at that point that the commit operation was sent up there. And then at that point, the host will stop people from using that index as it's in the midst, midst of changing it and uh, adding the new, you know, adding the entries in or removing the entries. Um, we, we do differential indexing. So even before we do the lock, we try to go through and find what the old data was and what the new data is and try to minimize the amount of changes that we need to make to the index. When you do an update operation, we don't just go through and delete all the words from the index and then go through and then add all the new words to the index. We go, we do pre-process the changes to minimize the amount of time that we need to keep the index locked. But still, if you have a bunch of people doing queries on this one primary key and for some reason the, you have some, uh, you have very large primary keys or something that's causing the, the, the indexing of that key to be slow, uh, clients will be uh, uh, delayed until the index operation is completed. Thank you.
if a client changes data, it's always sent to the temp file on the server? Yes. And then it's when you send a commit, it will be uh, uh, sent into the database itself? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, sometimes the commit operation occurs at the end of the upload process. Sometimes a separate packet, um, but it occurs soon afterwards. If you're looking at the network traffic, sometimes you'll see a separate commit or a separate packet going up to do the commit operation. Sometimes it's the last operation of the download. So if the download succeeds, then there's a last key at the end of that list of things to do saying, okay, if, you, if this got successfully uploaded to the temp file, move it to the main file. This was a, this, this was a, a massive change between six and seven. And actually, I think some operations even in seven, I think at 12, we finally got rid of anyone that wrote directly to the main file. Um, uh, I think it may, it may have been like scripts or something like that that would write directly to the main file and not go through the temp file. And we were getting some data corruption errors in that case if the user, you know, if the user you know, crashed during the middle of the upload or the network went down during the, the upload process and stuff like that. So as of 12, we've moved everything so that everything goes to the temp file first before, uh, uh, before, before we do the commit operation to then move things to the main file. And is it also sent to the temp file on the client? Because otherwise it will have to be sent back to the temp file of the client. Um, actually, After when the, when the notification is gone, so when the user edited it, edited, editing it on the temp in, the, in their client side, they are editing a copy that's in the temp file already. So when they're changing the fields and stuff like that, and how the lock manager and the notification manager works is that the person that initiates the change never gets the notification back himself. So he never gets the notification coming back saying delete the data because you're the one that created the data. Okay, it looks like we're out of time, so uh, it's time to eat. So I'll see you guys tomorrow morning. So.